Jesus Christ, it's been a while, hasn't it? I haven't done one of these podcasts in a long time. I'm not even going to bother checking. I'm not even going to bother checking how long it's been. It's probably been about six months. So first of all, yeah, I do apologise for not making um, a podcast in a while. I have been kind of posting videos on my main channel every now and again. I'm trying my best with it, you know what I mean? I'm trying, I'm trying as hard as I can. At the minute, I feel like time's moving really, really fast, and I don't know why... I just don't seem to have time to do anything. I feel like every time I go back home to make a video, I get this really weird urge that I just can't be bothered to do it. And I'm not one of these YouTubers that wants to go home at a weekend after being at uni or working in Manchester, then go back to Yorkshire and just, I don't want to be going back home just for the sake of making a video that I don't like. I'll never do that. I'll never put out a video that I think this is shit. I made a few videos in the past, and especially like in the past few months that I've made, filmed, edited and then I've watched it back and been like what is the point in this this is just a load of old tossing shite so that's why I haven't made a, a podcast either in a while because I got into like a really good mindset with it and then I just kind of fell off because basically um I really like recording these podcasts with other people um, I've only ever recorded one with Reese, and so he's kind of like my go-to and when he's not up for it or is not around or I'm in Manchester or whatever and I'm not and I'm not posting one I feel like an idiot and I feel like I even feel like an idiot doing them on my own because I feel like people not be interested by him on my own because there's, there's always, obviously it's always just me talking and I'm not that interesting my voice gets very annoying after a while so I can't if you listen to the whole podcast then chuff me there's some up with you if you listen to this voice for 25 minutes 25 minutes of your life and you're and you listening to this. Christ. Hello and welcome back to the Harrison Fletcher podcast. You're joined with me, Harrison Fletcher. And today, we're going to be changing things up a little bit. I've kind of decided that I want to change the way I do things on this podcast. Not when I'm with other people, that's fine. When I'm with, when I'm with other people, I'm kind of just going to stick to talking about them. And we're going to talk about stories. And we'll just kind of see what happens. I'll keep that very free and very open and very kind of like loosey-goosey, if you want. You know what I mean? Just having a laugh. Basically, I'm kind of going to change the podcast for what I'm doing it on my own. So what I mean by this is when I'm sat here on my own, I very... It's... Trust me, guys. It's very, very difficult to come up with, like, 25 minutes of pure dialogue of just you sat here talking to a microphone. It's very difficult. I don't know how people do it for, like, an hour. There's some people who do it for an hour. An hour of talking to you, Sen. Do you know what I mean? It's just... It's mental. As well as doing my YouTube videos where I talk to a camera on my end. It's, I, I'm taking it too far, aren't I? You know what I mean? So on YouTube, I have about three channels. Um, I have the podcast channel. I have my second channel and my main channel. My second channel is mainly um, daily vlogs. And then my main channel is the rants and the short films and stuff like that. And I'm going to be posting a documentary soon. But more to come on that later. I can say that now because I've got a... An actual schedule planned. I've got a I've got a little card here that says, "Talk about your documentary," but not yet, not yet. No, it's a little tease for you. So when I'm on my own, there's going to be a couple of sections. Um, this might change week to week, depending on what's happening. Um, but for most of the time, it'll be kind of similar to this because I'm quite happy with how it goes. So the first section we're going to go into is latest social media news. Uh, so this can be anything that's online, any media news, anything to do with anything. That's why I'm keeping it quite open. So the first article I'm going to talk about today is um, The Telegraph posted uh, this today. The date today is the 27th of April. And they've posted, Facebook could be used to find Madeleine McCann, expert says. Now, first of all, you read that and you're like, well... Eh. I don't think I don't think I quite believe that. You know what I mean? I'm not one to poo-poo an idea, but um, she's been gone about ten years. Chances are, Facebook's not going to be a big help. But let's see what they have to say. The only time Facebook would be of help in this situation is the Facebook memories. Do you know what I mean? If someone just happens to have a memory on ten years ago, you posted this. Oh, just kidnapped Maddie. <laughs> it's not going to happen, is it? Really? Let's be honest about it. Let's read what it says, though. If Madeleine McCann is still alive, she might be able to be tracked down on social media using scanning technology. Facebook's facial recognition tools could be used to look for images of Madeleine that may have been emerged since her disappearance ten years ago. Ten years ago! So she's going to change quite a lot, but let's see what happens. A retired detective, chief inspector and former forensics expert has said all this. It's called Mick 
Neville or Neville, I'm not quite sure because I can't really read that well. The social network Facebook already uses image identifying tools to create a, mo a model of people's identifying characteristics so that it can recognise faces even if they're not tagged. It uses include making suggestions for who might appear in the picture. Neville believes if as one theory about Madeline's disappearance suggests, she was abducted by traffickers and sold to a childless couple. It's highly likely that she will have social media presence, such as a Facebook profile or Snapchat account. Now, if I'm being honest, if I were Madeline McCann and I knew I'd been sold to a childless couple by some traffickers, then I wouldn't be on Snapchat just Snapchatting with dog filter on, sending it to sending it to. Bob down the road. Do you know what I mean? It's just it's it seems a bit daft. It seems it seems like a nice idea, but it doesn't seem like it's gonna be very um true. Now I'm looking at the picture at the minute that's like the famous picture of Madeleine McCann. I'm sure most people listening probably know who Madeleine McCann is. Um if you don't know who Madeleine McCann is, she's like a very famous I shouldn't say famous, it's a very horrible word, but it, she's like a famous child that got um either abducted, kidnapped, we, no one really knows what really happened to her, but we'll say kidnapped from now on, or murdered, or whatever. We'll say kidnapped because I don't really want to say murdered. She was kidnapped, um, supposedly, um, while, they were on, while she was on holiday with her parents, and her parents didn't know about it, and um, that's all you really need to know. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about um, the, the parents. The parents have released books, and they've gone on to be basically millionaires from the child gone missing so it's a very it's a very sticky subject um, and for this news to come out saying that she's gonna be able to be found via Facebook um, I don't think that that is what MI6 used to track down Osama bin Laden when they did Do you know what I mean it's just it's one of them situations that's like is this a load of shit? Yes, it is. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, there's more. There's more to read on that if you want to go and read about it. Uh, it's on the like I say, it's on the Telegraph. I'm not even sponsored by these. I just thought this would be a little cool little segment. You see, a serious side to Harrison. Do you know what I mean? I'm not really an expert. I don't claim to be. Uh, I'm just a guy who makes stupid videos on YouTube, and I'm just telling you my opinion on it. It's easy to talk, but it's not easy to talk about stuff like this. The next section is something that the title grabbed me straight away and I was like, right then, I'm definitely talking about this. So, the again, it's the Telegraph, not sponsored, but um, I won't mind being sponsored by them. Ban parents from pulling children out of religious education classes, Church of England says. Now, straight away, I'm thinking, why? I get it, and I, and I do get it. I went to a, a, I'm a, I'm an atheist, I'm going to put that out there right now. I'm, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God at all. Um, but... I went to a Catholic school, and a Catholic secondary school, and I didn't like doing RE, religious education, I hated it, but I still did it. So it's one of them things that you kind of have to either just put a weird man up about it, um, because I knew a few a few people in that went to my school, they did, um, their parents pulled them out of the class because they didn't agree with it. But end of the day, you're at a religious school, you've got to kind of respect, respect that, I guess. But it backfired on them in my school because I became the head boy at that school, uh, so, you know what I mean, an atheist, the head boy of a Catholic school. Irony. It's irony written all over it, you know what I mean? So, but yeah, let's read what it has to say. Parents should be banned from pulling their children out of religious education classes because they are preventing students from learning about Islam, the Church of England has warned. Derek Holloway, the church's lead on the religious education policy, said that those with fundamentalist religious beliefs are exploiting laws which give them the right to withdraw children from the lessons in order to stop them from learning about the Muslim faith. He also added that the parents are using dubious interpretation of human rights legislation to pull students out of classes, warning that such actions create a dangerous precedent. Again, I'm just reading a little section out for you. I'm not reading the whole thing out, obviously, because you can read it yourself if you want to go on to read it. It's uh, an article on the Telegraph. But um, I don't believe that pulling a kid out of a religious class is going to make him or her any more of, like... Um, basically, what they're trying to argue is that pulling um, a child out of a religious education class is going to make them more... Um, Hatred towards certain religions, um, especially like the Muslim faith. I don't necessarily believe that that's correct. I don't think that every child that gets pulled out of a, of a class 
is going to then have a hatred towards any religion, any said religion. I will just point out that the following are my views, um, and I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that this is right or wrong. I just kind of want to get out what my opinion on this is. I believe that you shouldn't have to teach religious education as such. It's one of those things that I think um, a religion is something that's like, in my view, like an activity. Like it's 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 a personal thing. Um, it's not something that you necessarily need in life to go out into the working world unless you're going down that path. Um, so my view on like RE in schools is that it kind of shouldn't be there anyway. Like I said, these are my views. If you agree with me or don't, I'd like to have a little conversation about this in the comments section. It'd be interesting. Arguably, you could say this is because I'm an atheist, but I, when I was younger, I was uh, I've... I am Church of England, uh, I am christened from being like a baby and when I got older to like about seven I started going to church um, and I used to go to church every Sunday and mainly for the sweets though I might add, I, I used to love getting the sweets, uh, we'd have like the singing bit about Jesus and how good he is, he's got his whole world in our hands, I was thinking chuffing I'll get them fizzy sweets now, so I went for the sweets but that's not, that's beside the point, I still went and I still kind of had a, a, this belief in God. And as I grew up, I kind of discovered that um, it was, for me, ridiculous. It's a nice idea, and the things that it teach, uh, the things that religion teaches, uh, is nice. On a hot, on, mostly like the morals behind the stories and stuff uh, about like treat everyone with respect and all that, love thy neighbour and all this. It's nice. It's nice stuff. But I think you learn that without religion anyway. Um, and I think religion only causes conflict. And I think religious religious people will definitely say that they're, on a whole, and mostly, probably just um, kind of deep down afraid of death. And they want to believe that there's not just that's the end. They don't want to believe that they die and then that's it. Whereas I kind of accept that as an atheist and think, right, yeah, once you're dead, you're kind of dead and that's it. But it's, kind of, it's, not like you, it's not like very doom and gloom. I just believe that everything is happening now and everything that I will be re rewarded in my life through working hard in my life. So that's kind of my views and I think that going back to the school situation, I don't think it should be necessarily taught in schools because it's one of those things that's like, if you're going to become religious, you, you'll discover it yourself through being exposed to it. You, you're, you're exposed to it from being a young age anyway. And religion's all over. You look, in, you look every direction and you'll see religion. There's a, you know what I mean? There's always... There's, a, there's such a big percentage of, of religious people in the world. So that's just my kind of thoughts on it. I just think it shouldn't be taught. I, I don't think it's something that you need to learn about necessarily. Um, because you learn about these things and you could be learning about other things that are going to kind of help you. Having said this, like the argument to replace that, I would say teach kids about more about things that are of, of a rising issue in, in the world. Um, like how, like things like basic things like you're not taught in school, like how to get a mortgage and um, how to set up a bank account, and you know all these sorts of things. Like you're not taught basic skills. You're kind of just like not basic skills, but basic sort of adulthood. You're not kind of taught about it. And I think it should be more about focusing on that before they focus on kind of slamming religion into young kids. Um, but that's kind of just my view. That was kind of long-winded version of that. In a way, I'm kind of saying get rid of it totally, and I don't necessarily agree with that either. Don't get rid of, rid of religion in schools totally. I just think it shouldn't be something that's like a compulsory option that every student has to do. If parents want to pull the kids out because they don't agree with what they're teaching and they don't, they don't want their kids to be exposed to it, then that's their choice. But they, shouldn't, they should then be compensated by something else. So put them into a different class that's still teaching them, they're not just pulled out into nothing. If you agree with me or disagree with me, I'd very much like to hear what you think about that. I'm not saying get rid of it all, I'm saying just get rid of most of it. Maybe make, maybe go over like roughly what religions are. I think especially in today's like sort of time with how bad religion is and how bad religion's kind of portrayed in the media, certain religions anyway, then I think it is, it should be made aware through that aspect, treat everyone equally, don't sort of presume from a certain religion that they are, uh, for example, terrorists, you know what I mean? Uh, it's just a bit of a daft way to see things, but um, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts, and that's it. So uh, that's it for the news round. This next section is all about films, it's the film section. Film section of the week. 
I don't know what that were. That was just a bit of me being mental. I've had some orange juice and I'm I'm kicking alive now. I feel great. So earlier this week or maybe last week, the trailer were released for um, Thor versus Hulk. I don't know how you pronounce the last word. It's Ragnarok. I think that's right, but I'm not too sure. Uh, you hardcore film geeks, please don't um, judge me. I'm just a I'm just a regular film lover. That's what I like to call myself. When I first watched the trailer to Thor vs Hulk, I was like, yeah, it, it looks alright. I thought it looked a bit crap, though, when I first watched it. I was like, it doesn't look that good. Like, I was thinking to myself, sometimes you watch a trailer and you're like, oh my god, something about that trailer just hooked me. Something about it, I don't know if it was the music, the visuals, I don't know what, the dialogue. Sometimes it's a collection of them all. But some, for some reason, when I first watched it, I was like, I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like the music. I didn't like how it looked. I thought it looked really obviously CGI, and that sounds really stupid. But I thought the CGI looked really rank. But on closer inspection, I watched the trailer a couple of times, as I do with all trailers. Uh, my girlfriend will vouch for that. I, I literally get addicted to trailers. I don't know if any of you guys like that. I think it might be some sort of syndrome, trailer addiction syndrome. I just love them. I watch trailers over and over and I'm like, this is amazing. I like this. This is great. It's like watching the film, but faster. You know what I mean? It's like putting the film on fast forward and you're getting all the best bits. That's what I like to see. A closer inspection, I was like, yeah, this is great. I like, I like this. It, sound, it sounds good. The music were perfect. But I don't know why, but for me to, for a trailer to be like that, I really like films. And for me to watch a, a trailer for a film that I, I love the Marvels. I love everything Marvel I love. So for me to watch that, like a kind of a franchise that I love and be taken aback by it and be like, oh, she looks a bit naff. But then having to watch it another couple of times to get kind of like the feel for it, I kind of think that's kind of bad. Um, a lot of people are raving about it and say it looks good and I think it will be good. Um, but having said that, my first instinct on the trailer wasn't, I want that impressed. Um, I'm kind of mixed about it. I'm kind of, I, I feel a bit mixed about um, how I think it'll be. But like I say, on a second, on a second, and third watch of the trailer, I was like, "Yeah, this looks, this looks good." But I'm still, I'm still gonna reserve my thoughts on how I feel about it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that. And also, I'm gonna say, um, today is the 27th of April as well, which is the release date of what? You got it right. Yes, it is. It's the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. So I'm really excited for that. That, I, I think that's going to be, I'm, I can't wait to go to the cinema and see that, I really can't. I was watching one of Jack Howard's videos um, the other day, and he mentioned something about when he first watched Guardians of the Galaxy, he wasn't very impressed at all with it. Um, and that's kind of my thought on when I first watched Guardians of the Galaxy. I thought it were all just like, it, it were too sloppy for me, it were too like jokey jokey tongue in cheek, trying to be like a superhero film, but it's kind of just messing about. But then after I watched it a second time, I was like, Jesus, these characters are, are really good. I really like the characters in Guardians of the Galaxy. I think that's the one thing above anything else If it, it, is, is the characters. Um, obviously, the CGI, the visual effects is all brilliant, but I think the writing and the characters are definitely what draw me into it. The, the, the bond between the characters is definitely um, one of those things that's really strong and I think Marvel are really good at doing that I think Marvel have uh, got better at it throughout making the Marvel films they've realized I think they've realized how important it is having a, a character with depth and I think uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 will just be more of that I've heard that it's quite emotional but quite funny at the same time which is great that's what I love comedy and crying don't everyone love that? <laughs> Don't everyone love a bit of crying every now and again? But no, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see it, and I think it'll be, I think it'll be great. I have no um, bad vibe from it. I think it, it looks great, and I think it will be absolutely spantastic. What are your guys' thoughts on it, by the way? I like to, if you've already seen it, because by the time this podcast goes up, it'll probably be um, the 28th of April, which is a Saturday. I believe I've been wrong, guys. All this time, I've just checked the date today. All this time I've been saying that I'm recording this on the 27th. It's not the 27th, is it? It's 28th. So I think tomorrow will be the 29th when you'll see this. But yeah, there we go. So if you guys want to uh, let me know what you think about it, because you might, some of you might have seen it, some of you might be going to see it. So let me know what you think. I'd like to hear what you think about it.
Now we're moving on to um, the second to last section of this podcast today, and that is um, the personal section. So this is where I'm going to talk about a bit about myself. Um, I don't know what this section is going to turn into. It's just going to turn into today. It's just about me talking about my documentary. A documentary? I didn't know you had a documentary coming out, Harrison. Yeah, yeah, I've got a documentary coming out. It's uh, it's a good one. It's uh, it's uh, directed by me. Uh, Written by me and uh, a film by me, so it's uh, and edit- edited by me as well. So pretty much worked very hard on this. I've been working on this for quite some time now, um, a good few months at least. I've been working on this for about two months, three months, and I believe it's uh, probably my best work to date. That's putting it above all my films. The people that I've shown it to have said that they really like it, so that's good. It's always nice when your peers say that it's good. Sometimes they might be lying, sometimes they might be not, but I know that most of the people that I've shown it to would be honest. And it's really in its final stages now. I think I might go and shoot one more day's footage of it, and that'd be it. But I'm just going to read you quickly. Um, I don't really know when that just cut off, my mic's just cut off, um, so I don't really know where it left off, but I'm just going to start by saying, I'm currently making a documentary and it's called The 70 Year Old Vlogger. It's about a guy um, who commented on one of my videos uh, a while back, um, the Yorkshire accent video, and when that was kind of popular, and I saw that he was an older gentleman, and I thought, right then, I'll go on his, I'll just click his channel, and he's actually a YouTuber, he makes YouTube videos, and he's a bit of a vlogger. And I thought this was really interesting. He's not actually 70 yet, he's 68, going on 69, but it's the nearest to 70, isn't it? So, he's, he's, he's an old fella, but with his such, he's such a nice bloke, he's, he's got such a, a great mindset towards it all, and he really does keep up to, to date with everything. Um, so, a brief outline of what it's going to be about here for you is it's a documentary about Patrick Pinder, a 70 year old man sharing his life on YouTube. What are his thoughts to this digital world inhabited by millennials? What does he find challenging? And does he consider himself to have been born in the wrong generation? Uh, so, that's something for you guys to look forward to. Um, I hope you are looking forward to it because I know that I'm really, really excited to release it. I've got some great people on board with this documentary, such as the likes of Lee Hinchcliffe and a lovely chap called Mark Dempsey who works at The Social Chain which is a very big um, marketing agency pretty much. It's just all exciting, it's all, it's all very well, it's all going very good, very smooth um, we've just got one more day shoe and then it's going to be up and that is, that is it, that's all I've got to really say so I hope you look forward to that. I feel like this section is going to be feeling a bit rushed for you guys but I am kind of, I'm rushed for time if I'm honest, I'm, ab- I'm about to go to work. I work in retail, so they're a bit stressy if I don't turn up on time, you know what I mean? I'm going to have to go now, because time's running over like mad. And thank you very much for listening. Um, I said I was going to answer some questions this week, and I haven't got around to doing that, but I will do that in the next episode for, for sure. I'm going to get back on track with these um, podcasts. So keep sending any questions, any questions in relation to anything, ask me anything, and I'll answer it at the end of the, do- of the podcast um, next week. So thank you very much for listening, and I will see you next time. Well, you won't see me, you'll hear me, but see you in a bit.